Uh, so this is something that's got to be uh, factored in as we move forward. And this is something our entire delegation is united on. We are united in fixing this problem. Uh, bigger Waters, as it came to be, you know, you actually had Maxine Waters on the House floor saying uh, catastrophic rate increases was never something that was anticipated uh, when she helped pass the law that has her name. Uh, and so when, you know, when we were flying over some of these communities uh, that are behind flood protection systems as we were looking at an oil refinery uh, that produces gasoline and other products for our country, we're also looking at the houses that house the workers uh, for those refineries. And those people, if they get a $20,000 bill uh, from FEMA for flood insurance policy, it's just not sustainable. It's not something they're going to be able to pay. Uh, so if FEMA thinks that this is going to help get to actuary rates, uh, you're literally going to be forcing people out of their houses. And so there's got to be a workable way. Uh, fundamentally, this is about families. Not about second homes, vacation homes built on the coast with disposable income, but about people who do work in these factories, people who are trying to send their kids to better schools, create a better future for future generations. And as I think uh, Parish President Robottom pointed out, for some of these families, they don't have the extra income to pay these higher premiums. If these are priced in such a way they can no longer afford, it actually undermines the National Flood Insurance Program. Families will have to do without flood insurance in order to make their other bills. And so there is kind of a, someone called it a catch-22. We're going to make it actuarially sound on the backs of working class families who can't afford to do it, so therefore we are going to undermine the program by pricing them out of participation. This is ultimately about families. And from then it goes to the soundness of the program. Next, it's about science. Uh, one of uh, Mr. Miller's assistants said they want to have good science. That's what we want too. If there is a flood control structure, a mitigation process that decreases risk, then why in the heck is it not being considered? We know that it is not. And so we can meet on the common ground of using good science to find out what truly is a family's risk, but never lose sight of the fact that if we don't do this right, that family will have no choice but to not participate. At that point, that oil being produced in St. Charles Parish is not going to Pennsylvania. And I can go down the list that boat being built in Terrebonne and Lafourche is not supporting the industry. This goes beyond our community, but most importantly, it goes to families and how working families of Louisiana support the rest of the country. Um, I've learned a lot, and, and a lot of it from the parish presidents, about the uniqueness of the area, how it's going to affect families as we walk through this. But I think the senators and representatives laid it out for you in, in three key components. One is getting the science right. And we talked about that. We talked about the levy uh, analysis and mapping process that we're going through that we're engaging in some of the parishes now, how that evolves into the future. And what we've committed to is working to get that science right. And where we have disagreements on the application of science, how we can come to agreement by looking at independent verification and validation of, of how we apply those methods. At the same time as we're, as we're doing that, one of the other things is, and this is a part of bigger waters that's there, and this is, it gets to the crux of some of the matter. One of the things that Congress asked us to do, many in Congress asked us to do, this doesn't speak to the affordability of provision, but it does speak to the rates, is to establish rates that reflect the risk. So as we apply the science, the question is, is what rate really reflects that risk? And what we're hearing from Parrish is simply those huge increases in insurance that may, re may reflect a, a risk, and, and that's part of what we're arguing about, is does the money really represent the risk, the premium? But in doing that, what does that do to property and property values? What does that do to the structure of communities? What does that do to current homeowners and future homeowners as they consider how to build, where to build, and whether they're going to buy property? That is a part of the affordability discussion. So it's not just about the ability for somebody to pay the premium. It's the whole financial impact in a community. And we're discussing more and more of that as we go through. Which gets us to that last part, the affordability part. There isn't a lot of room in the law to talk about how we apply it, although it asks us to study that. We've been talking about can we delay the implementation of certain provisions of the law as we find the answers to a number of the questions that we have. And the truth is, is we want to move it towards right. One of the major provisions in the law, without getting technical, is about how we map and how we map changes in getting the data right. The truth is, is that's not going to be implemented in our best case scenario until uh, the fall of 14. And it's because we're going through the processes to figure out what it means. 
to do the rulemaking that we may have to do, although we think a lot of this will be policy, to figure out how we're going to share the data, how we're going to go map through mapping changes, who's going to be affected, when they're going to be affected, and how that's going to impact areas. We want to get it right as well. So the, the, the discussion we've had today, that truth on the ground, seeing it in the parishes, seeing what they've built, how we can talk about the science and implement that, how that affects the affordability, is something we really want to talk uh, and go back and talk about. The last thing that Senator Ritter talked about, about legislation, one of those areas is I can provide technical drafting assistance on legislation, but proposing it is a different matter. And that's one I will take back to the boss. Uh, I'm sure it'll get uh, a, a lot of discussion when we get back to D.C. I've been parish broke for five years, and this is the most united I've ever seen our congressional people. When they found out that Marshall, what the impact of biggest who I was going to have, they immediately went to work, got together, cross party lines, and working for our people. But let's be, let's be honest, and the reason why we stand here today is the failure of the Corps of Engineers when an engineering error occurred on the 17th Street Canal. If we wouldn't be standing here today, that didn't happen. And part of the driving force of the biggest waters is because of Hurricane Katrina. I don't think it's fair for our people, I don't think it's fair for the federal government to ask our people who had, who had nothing to do with the increasing rates to help board this astronomical race. In my parish alone, it's gone from $655 a year to $25,000. These people have built up equities in their home, and they, <coughs> some of these people can use that to uh, put a second mortgage on their house to send their kids to college. That all goes away. they got to walk away from it. It becomes a ghost town. Parish government suffers. Hospital suffers. School board suffers. Uh, fire department suffers. It's, it's just a trickle-down effect. So. This, this, this is a very issue that we have to stop, I, I think, in the right direction. We have a long way to go. And just We've been through many hurricanes and, and an oil spill. This bill will have a greater impact on coastal Louisiana than all of those put together. We pulled ourselves up from the hurricanes and from the oil spill. This will destroy coastal Louisiana. Also, we've got to educate the rest of the country. As we heard today, and thank you so much for this trip. Other areas of the country want it to be self-sufficient, so do we. They don't know what's coming. California doesn't know. New York and the rest of the country, all states have flooding. We need to educate them to get on board to change this horrible law. And last but not least, I've been asking a question for over a year. What does this policy cost us? Our insurance guys write the policy and send it on with no risk. I learned today and we're paying 30% for overhead expenses. No wonder it's upside down. That's criminal in itself. You know, 30% to manage this upside down program. That's absurd. I don't know if anyone else is mad, but I'm angry today. That's got to be fixed. And that what has been passed will be detrimental to our communities. I am um, from St. John the Baptist Parish, and our communities are attempting to recover now. They're still trying to get back into their homes. And if they are forced to pay premiums that uh, we predict will come about, they will not be back in their homes. Our community cannot be restored, and that will happen throughout the country. Uh, but when we went up to Washington in May, uh, we talked to the actual staffers who uh, helped write the bill for Congresswoman Waters. And they said that um, y'all are the first group we've heard anything about. We didn't, we didn't know there was any problem with this legislation. We all know with legislation there are unintended consequences. And we said at that time, we may be the first group, but we're not going to be the last. This is not just a Southeast Louisiana issue. It's not just a Louisiana issue. It's a national issue. And Billy stole my line. But this, if allowed to go unchecked and unamended, will be more devastating than every storm we've been through, including Katrina and since Katrina, and even the BP oil spill. Uh, because this is, going to, this is going to ruin our local economies. This is going to destroy home ownership. It's going to have an effect on the real estate market, the banking industry, and ultimately on local government, uh, relies on these tax revenues when those properties' values go up and when those properties can't be sold, when people can't afford uh, to insure those properties. So we're at a major crossroads here. Uh, I uh, would appeal to Mr. Miller, as we did in, in the room, that uh, obviously there, there's still, although we've answered some questions, there's still more questions than answers at this point. And I think the prudent approach would be to delay the implication of the, uh, the, the uh, effect of this bigger waters 
until we can provide those answers, until we can come up with affordability issues and, and answers to those, because at the end of the day, this is going to be a freight train that's going to hit people, and a lot of people in a lot of communities don't even know what's coming on that track. So I think what we need to do is, is take a step back, give us time to work it out. None of us want uh, any, any uh, handout. We all agree it needs to be sustainable, but as I said in the room, it is going to be a catch-22. Because if this goes allowed, in unchecked and unamended, it won't achieve that goal of sustainability. In fact, it will have the opposite effect. But what we need right now is more information, real data that we can take to the rest of the country. Because believe me, when they hear what's coming, they're going to be just as upset, just as worried as we are about their home. So we will, we will keep asking for all the information because the worst thing we can do is give out false information and then lose our credibility. We want to take the facts to other parts of the country so they join us and let, let you know how serious it is to all of us. And you know, before you go on, I need to really say, Senator, thank you for making this happen along with Gina Wink. Because this is one of the most important days in Louisiana, believe it or not, because those of you in that room just now, we still learning about this. We still learn about things none of us really know. Because it looks like it keeps changing as we have these meetings. In saying that, and getting back to where I started from, can you imagine what our problem is? Our problem is first is not just a Louisiana issue, which a lot of people think it is. Y'all heard some of these guys. California don't know. I bet you the Missouri Valley, the Mississippi Valley, they don't really know. Our job here is to educate the people across these 50 states. They need to get on board because a lot of their own residences and, of course, commercial and small businesses don't really know and will be affected. North American continent that is different than Florida. The Everglades doesn't drain 40% of the continent. We do. The Mississippi River, Chafalaya, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Number two, I don't think there's <coughs> any other state in America that has been as disrupted by the federal government as ours. Let's start with the channeling of the Mississippi River, which prevented the overflow of the settlement from keeping our land up in the first place which is causing us to sink. That was the federal levying of the river to provide commerce for everyone in the nation and world. And our people are living, hanging on, we told they by their fingernails to the high ridges as the marsh it, you know, goes away at 30, you know, a football field every 38 minutes. Number two, the federal government then came in here by three decades ago and drove uh, the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet straight through St. Bernard Parish and devastated the land. So ran up the risk for the people of St. Bernard 400 fold. And then on top of that, the federal government asked us to produce more oil and gas for them than any other state in America. And the canals that the oil and gas industry runs eats more of our marsh. Then, when we go to ask the federal government to just share a portion, a small portion, a little portion, of the revenue that we generate for them, they tell us no and our risk goes up more. Then Katrina happens, their levees fail, and bigger waters passes. So Dave, we understand risk. We've lived here for 300 years. Okay? We understand it. But the federal government is driving up our risk. We're trying to minimize our risk. We're not getting a lot of help. We don't have enough money for levies. We don't have enough money for elevation. We don't have enough money. And I'm going to finally say this, and because I know if I go on, Billy Nungus will get up here and they'll be here all night. All right? <laughs> but besides that, you know, our people have been through storm after storm. And I want to say, and I told you this on the helicopter, and Mark was there. We have retreated as far as we're going to retreat. We're not retreating any further. Every storm for 200 years, our people have moved from Grand Isle to back up to West Wego. That's how people got to West Wego, because they fled from the coast. And then after the next storm, we moved north. I'm telling you, we're not going anymore. We are here. 
and we're going to build sustainably, and we are not going to take this risk on ourselves. Because A, your program will bankrupt because we'll all leave it and you'll bankrupt anyway. We can't afford to be in it the way we have it organized. And it's just not fair. And sometimes in this world we have to make things fit. Amen? We're still in red dollars. Red dollars. We're still in red dollars. We're not going anywhere. All right. Anybody else? One more question. Yeah. Uh, deal. Yeah. Um, you know, Joe, Joe uh, Schmo in Iowa doesn't know what's going on. Uh, uh, John Smith in Massachusetts, no idea. Could somebody tell me what the problem is? I mean, what from there to, to explain it to them? I mean, if, if it's so important to them, well, what is the problem so they understand what's going on? Well, when, when, when FEMA gets around to rolling out new maps for their area, uh, they're going to be as mad as we are. But, but, but so, and, and we don't have the good data from FEMA of what actually those numbers are. So all we can do is go around the country and scare the hell out of them, like the people of Louisiana are. And if we do that, uh, maybe we'll get enough votes in Congress to uh, to change this thing once and for all. And, and it's up to us. That's why I said we got to take a road trip. <laughs> if I can address that too. We have, my staff can get you a map of all the claims in the congressional districts across the country past this program. You can look at a district which has had a lot of FEMA claims or National Flood Insurance Program claims. Their rates are about to go up. They just don't know it. And so if you want to see that, you can. And you can see, for example, Pennsylvania has had, is, is one of the states that's had the most claims. Uh, and so you can go up to North Dakota or any place in the upper Missouri Valley and see where there's a lot of claims. Past this prologue, it's just that we're a leader in this issue. It's important for us to work with FEMA to hopefully get it right here so then it's right for everyone else.